sir we can start sir yeah i am ready you will be sharing no dr shivang yes sir yes sir. the mic screen yeah how many yes, participants sir. so far sir that i will let you know sir okay okay so no yeah no rajib jain sir has come yeah he will join sir he will join he will join yeah yeah so today wait for dr rajib jain sir yeah uh, dr saman will start sir please okay. Okay, let us start, Shabang, or we'll wait for one minute. Sir, we can start, sir. We can okay, start. good enough, good enough. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very good evening to all. At the outset, I would like to thank AOH Delhi branch, Dr. Ganjendra Kumar sir, and Dr. Shivang for inviting me to moderate this session. This is all about DigiConnect webinar. Well, this NOH, you know, DigiConnect program is a virtual knowledge sharing platform. which is running since almost since 2 years and kudos to delhi branch for running this so successfully and i would also like to thank congratulate dr rajiv jain sir is the man behind the success of this program it is a feast of knowledge not only for the related to the occupational health but also various specialties has also has been dealt across but the best part of this program is this has been recorded and it has been uploaded onto the youtube so the doctors if they are not free they can definitely go back to this you no know, program and look into this program that's something very good actually only thing is you need to log into your youtube once you log into the youtube type enjoy and digit connect and then probably you can see the topics whichever topic you are feeling definitely can look into that coming to the today's cme today is the 99th issue of series 1 and i'm happy that uh, the 99th batsman is our own very own uh, dr suhas chakravarty dr suhas chakravarty he is a psychiatrist by profession he is a deputy chief of uh, medical services at hcl that is hindustan aeronautics limited he is practicing since more than two decades that's a very long time actually and in fact he has done his md in psychiatry from guwahati as a post doctoral medicine you know fellowship in child and adolescence psychiatry and also the post graduate diploma in you know addiction medicines in in nimans is also been you know uh, one of the diploma courses in the community have men mental health in the same institution has been done he has been awarded with many you know uh, the madhavan men uh, madhavan award memorial award in 2012 for the best research paper in the occupational health in fact mohan mallu award in 2017 for the best research you know paper for uh, the industrial medicine was also awarded to him not only that he has been a publisher you know in fact uh, he was one of the author for one of the uh, book in one of the chapters that the mental health at the workplace something very unusual and something very good it's good to hear that actually and he has got lot of publication in the national and international journals and in fact i would had a privilege of you know working under him he was i was working as a joint secretary with uh, dr uh, suhas and is a very very nice person very sweet person a very golden hearted person i have never seen him getting you know angry for any of the things he was very soft very kind enough and in fact it's something like a pleasure to you know welcome him and probably you know, call him for the talk he's going to talk about managing depression in the general practices do's and don'ts well as a diabetologist we see lot of patients do they do come in with lot of depressions once they come into us when once they get diabetic they become more depressed when the depression sets in then it becomes very tough for a diabetologist to treat them because you know we also know that the depression leads to lot of overeating maybe the mental balance is not good the sugar doesn't get under control it's a big challenge for us so i'm very eagerly to waiting for dr suhas to really talk about managing depression in the general practice over to dr suhas take over and just start the session <laughs> thank you uh, i am audible i hope yeah yeah so uh, thank you for the nice words that you have said about me dr suman in fact when you were telling all these things i kept my laptop volume to the highest level and my better up was also listening so hopefully next few days breakfast will be on time and dinner and lunch will be more tasty now when i talk about uh, food i uh, i know that you know before when you go to anywhere before serving the main course they will be giving you starters and then uh, the main course will come so here also before going to the topic proper uh, i'll give a starter and the starter will be how much tasty that you will come to know once the starter is presented to you so dr shivan can you share the screen okay yeah thank you so much so i will be trying to finish my presentation within 30 minutes i can see by my watch that it is 635 so i will be 
trying to finish by five past seven. So myself, Dr. Shuhas, which has been nicely introduced by my good friend, Dr. Suman. Uh, next, yeah. So as I was talking about the starter, so let us give the starter, the depression. Dr. Suman was talking about diabetes. You know, diabetes and hypertension are called two silent killers. I add one more, depression. Why? Because it's a leading cause of disability and major contributor to global burden of disease that has been narrated since long. Right now, according to estimate by the Institute of Health Matters and Evolution, which was done worldwide and was taken by the US uh, initiative, 280 million, that is around 5 to 5.7 percent of adults in this world are having depression, suffering from depression. If you see over 7 lakhs people die every year due to suicide, we'll see the Indian data also soon. Suicide is the fourth major leading cause of death in 15 to 29 year old group. And if you see that is a very, very, uh, you know, that age group where the people are supposed to be most productive. Treatment gap is 75% in low and middle income group countries. So this is one of my favorite slides because two points I'm trying to, uh, I mean, uh, we have to note down here. One is that depression has been the second largest contributor for global burden of disease by 2020. This was a prediction by WHO and which has been correctly predicted. Now there is one more prediction by WHO. It is going to be the leading cause of disability by 2030. So it, which is hardly eight years from now. And many people are telling this prediction was done by WHO before the COVID pandemic came. And after the COVID pandemic came, it may actually well advance by a few years, where depression will be number one, followed by ischemic heart disease. If you see a national mental health survey across all India in 2016, which was done, I remember correctly, almost in 36 cities, almost uh, 35 or 37,000 uh, persons in India, because when it comes to data uh, prevalence, we lack data in India, but this was a wonderful study and which found that prevalence of common mental diseases, which include depression, anxiety, is almost like 5%, which is equivalent to the world data that we have seen. It has been found that in India, as in the world, females are most suffered by depression than male. The 40 to 59 age group is the most highest prevalent. 60% has some kind of disability. They're not able to go for duty or they, are, they cannot earn their livelihood. And that's a quite huge percentage. And if you see the treatment gap, we saw the world data around 75%. In India, it is 80%. That means 80% people from depression do not get the correct care that they should have got. And that is the, I mean, you know, purpose of my presentation. I hope that after this presentation, at least all of us will be able to initiate treatment, initiate, if not, you know, continue and other things. So if you see the suicide data, I don't go into details of that. If you follow from 2016 to 2020, we can see it's an ascending graph. Every year it is increasing. And that is not a good sign for a country which tries to develop in all aspects. So if you see, there are a variety of medical illness where depression is very common. Dr. Suman has already told about diabetes mellitus. If you know hypothyroidism, stroke, myocardial infection, we are going to see a battery of diseases where depression. So when anyone is suffering from any disease can have depression, but when anyone suffers from such kind of diseases, depression is a comorbidity that all of us have to uh, you know, remember. Because if you don't treat the depression, as Dr. Suman has told, the other disorder cannot be treated properly. Yeah, so this is very interesting, child. If you see that in cancer and Parkinson's disease, 50%, one out of two, five out of 10 suffer from depression, where in stroke, myocardial infection, in diabetes, almost one out of four, something uh, like 23% to 27%, and that's quite huge number. So depression is definitely a problem which all of us need to combat. So coming to depression and diabetes, already known, only one study, I will just uh, you know highlight, this is called interpret DD study results, which has been done in various countries, except US and UK. 
and India is also participating in India, Brazil, Argentina, Sri Lanka, and some other countries. And it has been found that in patients with diabetes mellitus, the current major depressive disorder, and this is by standard psychiatric interview, not by any question or anything, 10%. When you use the questionnaire, that is where, which is more you know, useful in detecting depression, it is almost double. And risk factors, female gender, people who are less exercising, past history of depression, low level of education, uncontrolled diabetes. So if you see, it is a bi-directional. Once you don't control depression, diabetes gets uncontrolled. Once you don't control diabetes, depression goes out of control. So we need to control both. If you see depression and ISD, the picture is same. Depression increases the risk of ISD by 1.5 to two times. 16 to 18% of heart attack we have already seen is almost like one fourth. So, and what is important is that 16 to 18% of the heart attack patients, they develop depression during the hospital stay. So once they come back home, totally, if you take, it is almost like one fourth. That is that we have already seen that. So again, hypertension, diabetes, ISD. If you want to control it correctly, depression, comorbid depression, if present, has to be treated. There's no doubt about that. I think, yeah, with this, I have finished the starter. So I think everyone uh, is aware now that uh, depression is a disease as you know, uh, one of my, my department head was also telling that a few years down the line, depression will become like hypertension and diabetes. So what are the do's coming to the prop, topic proper? And what are the do nots that we should follow while treating depression? So suspect depression, that is what I have been telling so far. Screen, we are going to see how we can screen. It is not very difficult, like any other screening. Diagnose, then pre-treatment counseling. These are the some of the you know, specialist things that in depression we need to keep in mind. Pre-treatment counseling, very important. Formulating a treatment plan is very important. And once you do that, what for? Start treatment. What is important is follow-up. I'm going to say that how we are going to do follow-up a patient. Look for adverse effects, which is very common um, that, you know, uh, depression patients are a little sensitive. So any mild effect, which is because of any other medicine in any other disease, patient will tolerate. In a depressed patient, you mean a very mild effect also patient will try to highlight it and you have to deal with it. Look for compliance because many people do not feel they need treatment. Many people do not want to take medicine. Many people do not want to come for psychotherapy. Many people after getting improvement, stops the medicine prematurely. Compliance is a big factor. Assess improvement and need for referral. So suspect is very important and studies have shown that just asking simple questions, two questions like in last two weeks, have you ever fell down depressed or hopeless? You can word, use the word depressed if the patient doesn't like, have you felt little low down? And second question, are you able to enjoy the life the way you have been enjoying in the past. If you ask these two questions and if you get an affirmative reply, the, you can see the sensitivity is quite high, almost like 85%. So it is hardly that you will be missing out depression. So screen, there's a very good questionnaire called Patient Health Questionnaire, PHQ-9, freely available in internet. There are nine simple questions to which there are four replies. The replies will be marked as not at all, sometimes, few times, most of the times, and will be scored as zero, one, two, three. And total score, as you know, because there are nine things, total maximum score will be 27. So if anyone scores more than five, and it is very easy to remember because it is multiple of five, five, 10, 15, and 20. So out of 27, anyone scores more than 20, severe depression, scores more than 15, it is moderately severe, more than 10, moderate depression, more than five, mild depression. So what you need, to, why you need to, you know, uh, subtype depression as moderate and mild, I'm going to tell you in the next slides. So once you diagnose, like by screening, we find that, so what you have to diagnose is, like in many other diseases, like, you know, rheumatic fever and other things, we have a major criteria and we have a minor criteria. This is a criteria which has been given by International Classification of Disease, ICD-10, what we follow in India, apart from DSM-4 and uh, DSM-5 criteria. So major criteria, one is time limit, two weeks, but okay, time limit is not important as long as you feel that symptoms are quite, you know, uh, uh, transparent. So one is 
major criteria is low mood number 2 loss of interest or enjoyment we say lack inability to ex- inability to experience pleasure and number 3 reduced energy leading to increased fatigability and diminished activity these are the three major criteria followed by seven minor criteria out of that we can uh, like uh, i have put it according to icd 10 but for the sake of remembrance we can keep it like this like there are some core symptoms of depression you will find here reduced self esteem ideas of guilt i am worthless and bleak and pessimistic views of the future then there are some cognitive deficit like reduced concentration and attention ideas uh, disturbed sleep and diminished appetite so and most uh, you know dangerous symptom that is ideas of self harm or suicide what you have to remember is that many people do not will tell you the core symptoms of depression like low mood they will be complaining of some lack of concentration tiredness lack of attention not getting sleep we have to suspect that is key so mild is two major criteria plus two minor criteria moderate is two plus three and severe is all three major criteria plus minus four but i'll tell you this is for theoretical for the purpose of practice your intuition your sixth sense will give you an idea once you spend a little bit of time with the patient that whether it is a mild depression whether it is a moderate depression whether it is a severe depression mild you will understand the smile nothing functional impairability no day to wish severe you can understand day to wish and other uh, uh, suicidal ideas lack of functioning everything will be there anything which is between mild and severe you can put it in moderate so as i told the most important thing is the pre treatment counseling now why pre treatment counseling because depression is a disorder where the patient will not always readily come to the th- uh, doctor to seek treatment patient will not understand and that is why it is known as a silent killer i already compared with hypertension how often we see a person with a blood pressure of 180 by 110 without having any symptoms do not come to a physician and do not take treatment and we know the consequences similarly depression a person whether with mild moderate or severe do not will readily come to the doctor unless he or she is referred by someone like you or feels there is something biological dysfunction so establishing a therapeutic relationship is very important because we have to keep the patient on a long term medication we have to understand it is not like a, like giving antibiotics for one uh, one week so is very important and that is the first step second step is education to the patient not only the patient even to the family members one of the important thing we have to understand that patient with severe depression having suicidal ideas family members have to take care of the medication medication has to be given under supervision another important aspect is that it may take 2 to 4 weeks or more for improvement of the symptoms that is something is because of the pharmacology of the antidepressants and unfortunately that is another barrier for effective treatment and the fourth thing is that when we start the treatment we have to call the patient at least weekly to see whether the patient is taking medicine or patient has stopped medicine whether the patient has got any adverse effects and that patient has used as an excuse to stop medicine we also have to ensure adequate compliance keep the dosing simple so that it is easy ensure an active lifestyle is very very important studies have shown that exercise little bit how much it acts as an you know uh, agonist with antidepressants address myths that certain antidepressants are addictive we have all up to tell that you know how often you have seen that you know when we write some medicine patient do not take uh, because of the addiction uh, fear but the same patient has been taking alprazolam in high, higher doses from the pharmacy thinking that those medicines are quite safe so and this happens in bangalore the place a metro in india so you can think about what is happening in other cities so what is another last important thing is we have to provide support and reassurance so we have a bag of antidepressant i would not like you to look at the right side but look at the left side ssri is at the main stay of the treatment we have acetylopram sertraline fluoxetine 
fluvoxamine, paroxetine, citalopram also used in some cases. We have SNRIs like duloxetine, venlafaxin, and we have the TCS, which not only the psychiatrist, but all physicians like are using for a long time, something like amitriptyline. Next slide. So these are the recommended doses that we can see later on. I'm not going to details of it. What is important is we have to formulate a treatment plan. And there, that is where it is important to categorize whether it's a mild depression or it's more than mild depression. Because according to the recent guideline, recent onset mild depression, antidepressant should not be used. What is just supportive therapy, counseling, self-help, simple tips, exercise. And when an antidepressant is prescribed, a SSRI is recommended to be given in a general uh, uh, medical setup. SSRI is safest, recommended for treatment to moderate to severe depression and dysthymia. Dysthymia is a condition, something like a chronic depression and if it is present for more than two years. So what is we have to remember is, if you feel that is a moderate to severe depression, don't wait for anything. You can straight away start a medication. All SSRIs are safe, equally effective, and discussion with the patient is important. We have already discussed in detail in the pre-treatment counseling. So the commonly three most commonly used SSRIs I'm going to talk about in details, because if we know how to use these SSRIs, I think we can at least initiate treatment in uh, each and every cases. One is acetylopram. I know that many of us are using this. Another is fluoxetin, another is cytolin. Acetylopram, we can start with 10 milligram in an adult and we can increase to 20 mg after one week or 15 days if, if it's necessary. There are conditions like OCD where a center from up to 30 mg is given, but it is better to leave it to the psychiatrist. It's the most well-tolerated SSI. Very hardly you will see the patient will come with any side effects and fewer drug interactions. That is another important thing because when you are treating depression and with a medical comorbidity, we know patient will be already on other medicines on polypharmacy. So that is something we should remember. Fluoxetine is another good drug. What uh, the starting dose is 20 mg. And you have to remember that fluoxetine also acts very nicely in patients with depression with little bit of OCD features. In OCD, the antidepressant dose is always higher than in depression. In fluoxetine, we can go up to 60 mg. We can, uh, specialists can go up to 120 mg, but it is better to stick to 60 mg only. And one advantage of fluoxetine is that it has got a long half-life, so withdrawal features will be less. And second thing is that weight gain is minimal or almost no weight gain with fluoxetine. When it comes to cytolin, we can start with 50 mg. We can increase and keep on increasing up to 200 mg, again under supervision, after giving a gap of minimum two weeks to four weeks. The important thing about cytolin is, apart from depression, cytolin is also a good antidepressant in anxiety along with depression. So in patients like panic disorder, PTSD, social anxiety, sertraline is a good choice. And in anxiety disorders, if you feel that mainly anxiety, not depression, we can start at a lower dose like 25 mg. So these three medications, escitalopram, fluoxetine, and sertraline, if you know about these three medications and details, I think we can initiate treatment in most of the patients. So all patients should be informed about the withdrawal effect of the antidepressant. Why? Because this antidepressants has to be given for a longer time. The guidelines suggest first episode depression treatment should be for nine to 12 months, six months after improvement. We have already told the patient takes minimum one and a half to two months to improve fully. So once you improve, then after that you continue for six months. So three plus six is makes almost nine months. And then we have to gradually reduce it. And why you have to reduce it, I'm going to tell you. So almost total period takes around nine to 12 months. Patients who are more than two prior episodes should be treated for minimum two years. And for treatment resistant depression, it is better to refer to a specialist. When you will say the treatment resistant depression, when you find that variety of antidepressants we're giving and none of them are working. So usually a trial of two, more than two antidepressants for a sufficient period like four to six weeks is called test treatment resistant. Many people have doubt about ECT. Yes, we are using ECT, severe depression with suicidal features and where the medication uh, compliance is doubtful, 
or we have to save the life of the patient, the CT is still used, but the usage is coming down day by day. Side effects of SSRIs is very important. We should know because what is important is that depressed patients being sensitive, they will come essentially after a few days with some side effects. They will have some vague gastrointestinal, I'm not telling vague, they'll be having some you know, unspecified gastrointestinal symptoms like abdominal fullness, flatulence, nausea, Okay, so we can give some anti-PPI or something, uh, H2 receptor antagonist. Some people also have an anxiety, especially when you give fluoxetine. It's a little bit of excessive drug, et cetera. Problem. So there's no harm in giving some, something like fluorazepam or lorazepam for initial two to three weeks. But one thing we have to remember that when you start benzodiazepines, we patients should not abuse that medication. Patients should be called for follow-up quite often. Other important things which you need to remember is hyponatremia, low sodium. This is especially important while treating elderly person who are on diuretic or patients with kidney diseases with a lot of comorbidities and depression. So that is another important. Another important, which is very important and for which the patient do not take treatment properly is sexual dysfunction. So make it a point to ask about the sexual life once you start any of these antidepressants like acetylpromphloxetine. What is important is that it is not permanent, it is reversible. Once you stop the medicine, patient will get back the, you know, to the normal level of functioning. If it is significant, there are some, some drugs called metagepine, buprepan, and now new onset vortioxetine has come. So this doesn't have any sexual thing. But we have to remember that SSRIs, though they have a sexual side effects, but they are very effective. Another thing is weight gain. That is, we should keep the mind. So we should encourage the patient to uh, you know, to, to take diet, which is uh, not weight producing and also go for exercise. So what to do about the side effects? Choose the drug, which is, you know, uh, like uh, favors the patient, like patient on polypharmacy, acetylopram, patient with obesity, fluoxetine, patient with little bit of, you know, food uh, problem, eating disorder, fluoxetine, start low, go slow. There's no harm. I told acetylopram 10 mg, you start and go to 20 mg. You can very well start with 5 mg. You can go to 10 mg. You can go again to 15 mg. Now 15 mg preparations of acetylpram are also available. Focus on tolerance. Our idea is to keep the patient on long-term medication. Ask about sex life already I've told you. What is important is that some of the symptoms of depression and some of the symptoms of you know, SSRI-induced side effects will be almost the same. So we have to take a detailed history and we have to tell the patient whether the side effects were there, whatever the patient attributes to the medicine before he started medicine. And you will be surprised to know that in many cases, people will tell, yes, yes, it was there earlier also. Then you can tell the patient that it is not because of the medication, but because of the disease. And you are taking the medicine and this will reduce this complaints. So wait and wait and wait, because most of the side effects come down after 20 days. Reassure the patient, very important. If you feel some medicine you have given in the morning, causing some disturbance, sleep, you never know. I have told fluoxetine, another important is it is not uh, sleep producing. But still I have seen some patient who after giving fluoxetine complex of, complex of little of drowsiness. So you can give the fluoxetine in the evening, no problem. Lower the dose, add other agents and switch to a different agent if you feel that patient is too rigid. So consider stopping the antidepressant. As I told you that if no symptoms for six months and patient has gained full function functionality, what we have to remember is before stopping medicine, we have to discuss with the patient that yes, I'm going to stop it and you have to do it slowly. Please do not stop any antidepressant. All of a sudden, they are having a lot of discontinuation syndrome. So abrupt discontinuation is not suggested. Some of the common you know, withdrawal symptoms are giddiness, weakness, nausea, again, rebound depression, anxiety features, and person may have some, some feeling not good. So as I uh, told you that, you know, that is why we go for a slow uh, tapering and then stopping. So what to do about the discontinuation syndrome? We have to again reassure by two to four weeks, all will go. If you feel that, no, it is troublesome the, for the patient, it is not going, reintroduce. Reintroduce at a lesser dose and reduce slowly. So suppose you are giving 20 mg of acetylopram and you have made it 15 mg and patient has started showing, uh, you know, uh, 15 new patient was okay. Then you reduce to 10 mg and patient has started showing withdrawal symptoms. Don't make, next time you again start at 15 mg. From 15 mg, you go to 12.5 mg. 
from 12.5 mg, you keep 12.5 mg every alternate day, then give it 10 mg. So go for a slow deduction down like we do in case of antiepileptic as well. So now I have told you all the do's. Now it is the time for the do nots. So there is something called in uh, law uh, that do no harm. So uh, while treating the patient, it is equally important that we should not do any harm also. So what is important? Do not treat if there's a risk of suicide, refer to psychiatrist. Do not treat if it is severe depression with extreme psychomotor retardation, patient has stopped eating. Do not treat if there is a presence of psychosis along with depression. Do not treat if you are treating patient is not improving. It is going to resistance case, refer early. Do not treat if along with depression, there are other anxiety features, other comorbidities, ADHD. Do not treat if there is a presence of significant life stressor. Remember that I have telling about I have been telling I have been telling about medication, but in case of severe depression as well, allocate medication. Each and every patient should get counseling. If you feel there is stressor which needs expertise, psychotherapy, better to refer. And do not treat the special population group like children, adolescent, pregnant women, very elderly people. And do not treat if you have a diagnostic difficulty. Very often we see patients with negative symptoms of schizophrenia is given antidepressant and patient doesn't improve. Patient, and after four to five months of treatment, patient comes to us and we start antipsychotic and patient improves. So if you feel have a little bit of diagnostic difficulty, better to refer. So these are some of the, you know, sad persons. So I'm not going into the detail of this. Sad persons is an indicator to identify the risks for suicide. So if these are patients like men, more than women, age 15 to 24, depression, prior history, alcohol use, rational thinking loss, no one can help me, no support system, patient has planned suicide, patient has search in the internet, these patients are high risk for to commit suicide, better do not do, refer to a specialist. Do not treat if there is a serotonin syndrome, there is something called serotonin syndrome, when you give a mixture of SSRIs or when you give SSRIs with antidepressant, so some people, may, someone might have started amitriptyline because of some pain and patient has come to depression and uh, we have started SSRI. So patient can have serotonin syndrome. It is not very common, but we have to keep the serotonin syndrome in mind when prescribing any antidepressant to any patient. So do not treat if the patient was on concurrent medication which are depressogenic. And you'll be surprised to know beta blockers, digoxin, diltiazem, enalpril, and some neurotic medicine like levodopa, topiramate, baclofen, and OCPs, all of us know they are depressogenic. So if you feel there are any medications which patients will give history, I have got one case of a patient having atorvastatin and complaining of sexual dysfunction and going into depression. So we stopped the atorvastatin discussing with the physician and patient depression improved. So this is another thing we have to look at is the medication part. And lastly, as I was telling that the after starter, after main course, the dessert, which should be sweet. I don't know how much sweet it is, but uh, please do not treat normal sadness. Many times we end up over diagnosing and especially in COVID times, when you have seen so many people have lost their near and dear ones and they are suffering from normal sadness. They don't need antidepressant. They need simple supportive grief therapy. How to differentiate between a grief and depressive disorder? In grief, there'll be feeling of the loss. In depression, it is not anything particular loss. It's a persistent low mood. In grief, with the passage of time, things will improve, not in depression. In grief, the functionality will be lost, not lost. Patient will be able to be, go to the office due to cooking or whatever it is. In depression, the functionality may be impaired. Grief comes in waves when they, they remember that person. Depression, continuous. Grief may be accompanied. Sometimes they remember also the good times they have present and they, they have, uh, you know, uh, passed with the uh, person whom they have lost. Whereas in depression, you'll never get any positive emotions. Grief, they're always preoccupied with the loss, with the loss of human being or loss of any other thing. Whereas in depression, they'll be preoccupied with feeling of helplessness, worthlessness, and hopelessness. In grief, there is no loss of self-esteem. 
whereas a depressed patient will feel that he's worthless, his confidence level will come down. And guilt, if present in guilt, in grief, it will be associated with that I could not do enough for this. You know how often we have got, I am getting almost daily, post-COVID, I could not do enough for my, uh, the person whom I've lost. Here in depression, the guilt will be because of worthlessness. So these are the sad things. So we should not treat a normal sadness with antidepressant. So I think the last slide is visible to all of, uh, people can unmute and tell me that what they can see in the last slide. So Dr. Shivang, if you can give the opportunity to unmute the participants, I just want to know that what they are seeing in the last slide. Thank you. Okay, at least I come to know that people are not sleeping after this depressive lecture on depression. Thank you, Dr. Suhas. It was really wonderful. I think probably you kept up your words. You said that nine past five minutes, seven past five minutes, you're going to finish. You just took one minute extra. Just to explain about your thank, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was really nice. It was interesting. But in fact, uh, in one of your, uh, this one, you told that, you know, the psychiatrists are the ones who know nothing and do nothing. But you proved it wrong. You know everything. You do everything. So very happy to see all your presentation. It was really nice about it. And uh, we have got a couple of questions which are there. I will just try and ask the questions so that let us see how things will go. And uh, suppose a person, what is the criteria for fitness to work or duty is what has been asked. Suppose a person gets into depression and what is the criteria, what you take to say that the person has come out of depression and is fit to work? Yeah, that's a very uh, good question. In fact, what we have to remember is that one of the recommended treatment for depression is also behavioral activation. That means to make the patient, you know, in active in day-to-day -day life is one of our goals. We don't want the patient of depression to take a bed rest or remain at home. That will increase potential depression. So once we feel the patient is compliant, suppose if the patient, in spite of depression, is coming to the workplace and doing the duty, let him continue. We do not have to advise any bed rest. If the patient has not gone for the duty for a few weeks, then we start medicine, we see the compliance, we assess the suicide risk, we talk to the patient and we encourage and motivate the patient to join duty as early as possible. So if the patient is on compliant medicine, family support is there, patient has you know, after assessing, you understand the sufficient improvement is there. No suicidal risks. The person can be given fitness. Please remember, it is better to give fitness rather than not to give fitness in depression. Thank you, Dr. Suvas. And we had one more question. How do you recognize a patient is going to commit suicide? Suicidal tendencies are very high. How do you say that? Yeah. Which patient can commit suicide? I have already given mnemonic like five persons uh, because of that. But what I will tell you is that, and uh, contrary to the concept, that asking to a patient about suicidal intention doesn't increase. I repeat, asking a patient about suicidal intention doesn't increase the frequency or incidence or intention of suicide. So that is one question we should ask to everyone. We should also see whether there is a past history of suicidal attempts. We have to see whether there is any family history of completed suicide. We have to see whether the patient has made any organic plan, has searched the internet, or of late, the patient has detached himself from the surroundings, not taking part in any of the activities, keeping, you know, one step aloof. These are some of the telltale signs of suicide. Thank you, doctor. One other question which the people have asked is, when the relatives of the patients are not cooperating, how do you manage and how do you treat these patients? That is, uh, Dr. Swaman is not only in depression, that is something like we feel in almost like all patients. Uh, what we try to do is, uh, that is why the psychoeducation is very important. And uh, it's a very difficult thing. It depends on the charisma of the doctor. It depends on, that is why if you remember, 
uh, I was uh, highlight establishing a rapport, establishing a rapport, rapport. That is very important. Once the patient has a belief that this is the person who can, you know, uh, alter my life, the problems, I am telling you, patient will stick to you. So you need to establish a lot of time. And this I have been telling from my experience. If you can convince them that, you know, some of the times I tell, please take the medicine for a few weeks. If you don't like, you stop it. This medicine is not going to do any irresistible effect. And the patient will come. Nowadays, we are having so many effective antidepressants. That's good, actually. In one of your slides, you clearly mentioned that, you know, Parkinsonism is one of the major leading causes of is there any particular reason behind that? Because, you know, cancer, we can understand. Diabetes, we can understand. Because it is a social stigma or whatever it is. But why Parkinsonism patients are having more of a depression? Because it is one of the things is that disability. If you see disability, frequent fall, okay, they cannot even hold a cup of tea also. They cannot drink a cup of tea. So many of the okay. Parkinson's patients, they have a memory loss also. The memory is not so severe that they don't understand that losing memory. So they understand that I'm uh, where they have kept the, you know, in Canada, they call where I have kept the Canada, where I have kept the stakes. They don't remember. This all lead to depression, mainly the disability. How do you differentiate malingering versus the psychiatric patient as such? There are a lot of patients who say that, you know, I'm in depression, but they are yeah. not in depression. Just to make that, sure that the family members that, are convinced. They tell that, us. See, these issues come up only when you, I have told a typical depression patient, it will be difficult to, you know, convince the patient or agree to the patient for depression treatment. When you see someone where the subjective complaint and the objective observation are not matching, patient is very keen. Before you started telling, only patient is telling, I am having, I am very sad, I am not sleeping, everything. You ask one question, patient is telling all. You should doubt, you should suspect. Second thing, we also have to look for any secondary gain. Gradually, I thought, so I understand that. Is it any recent transfer? Someone has tested or anything like that. Patient will hear because if you're depressed, the patient readily will come. Yes, yes, yes. I have been transferred. My whole family is there, and you can make out. It's good history taking a deficient between a malingering and the depression, and a mismatch between the subjective complaints and the objective sense. Thank you. I think Dr. Tyagaraja sir has lifted his hand. Sir, you can unmute uh, and you can ask the questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, both are. Uh, it's okay. You, you, you are audible, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, at the outset, uh, uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Suman. You have uh, wonderfully moderated and uh, professionally, it is very good. Uh, you have stick to the very wonderful way of uh, moderating. I think uh, it is a really a good uh, benchmark uh, to all of us. And coming to the subject, uh, uh, Dr. Suas, a wonderful uh, is uh, I, I am I'm very very proud that he's from Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. Uh, why I am telling you is uh, uh, so today if I am a doctor it is only because of Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, not because of anything. To, uh, if my children are doctors it is because of Bharat Electronics. But I became doctor only because of HL because we were, had a shop and uh, because of that only I could uh, get educated. Behind the hospital is the NTM school was there. There only I studied. Uh, so, was here, are you hearing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> hearing okay. 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 I am also uh, very good to my organization. Yeah. Very yeah. Well, uh, wonderfully, you have uh, the topic is so, so nicely. You have explained the causes, uh, moderation, and the tria, the work, uh, and especially diabetes, and uh, this one. And uh, this kind of lecture we used to hear from uh, one of our senior most colleague, Dr. Shivarama Krishnan. He is also a wonderful speaker from Mumbai. He used to speak. Uh, I think he maybe he is maybe there, and Dr. Uh, Pingle sir also may be there. Uh, they will also highlight. And uh, very nicely you have explained uh, about uh, diabetes and uh, all the individual explanation, what you have given treatment and all. Very nice. It is just like a uh, postgraduate, it is. And uh, it is uh, surpassed all the benchmark and the road, uh, roadmap of uh, this one. You have stood to have uh, one of the national uh, speaker and the congratulations. You, 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 have, you have come up to the, such a wonderful stage that uh, you can henceforth uh, speak in the national level also. Thank you and congratulations and uh, all the best 
keep it up please yeah thank you one point i'd like to regarding whatever you have told even i will tell you hl has shaped me into become a very good psychiatrist i got a lot of patients i could write the medicine i want i could write the investigation that i want and most advantages is that i can follow up them because whether they like or don't like they have to eventually come back that gave me a very lot of feedbacks and i am i am really grateful to my organization yeah yeah and you should be very grateful to our mentor dr palakshanna yes yes yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah without without mentioning him i think uh, hl psychiatric will not complete yeah because dr palakshanna is the one who brought the department yeah he shaped he shaped the department very well okay thank you thank you thank you doctor sir thank you sir uh, i would just like to ask dr suha suha it is always said off generally you know headache is always a headache for a doctor that's what they say because it's very tough to treat actually just like that is there any headache for a psychiatrist to any particular case uh, causes more of a headache <laughs> sorry any any particular psychiatric cases you think that it's very tough to yeah, treat yeah. is uh, you know uh, there's a group of disorder well earlier people used to call hysteria nowadays we call it is a dissociative disorder okay where a adolescent male or female come with lot of peculiar movements of the body all the uh, investigations will be normal nowadays at least we have the luxury of conducting unnecessary investigation and showing to the attendant that it is normal there is a time when you do not have the luxury of investigation we have to depend on clinical judgments and if these patients take a long time those are the periods which was really for a psychiatrist you feel the patient because no one will give you that you are treating the you know in a right way they will be diagnosing with all neurological problems and other problems yes treating history that's good i think i think uh, dr shiva sir has raised this question sir you can unmute yourself and ask the question sir subhash subhash excellent presentation thank you sir now uh, my experience has shown that nowadays teenage students in the 10th and 12th going to depression not because the education system is bad but because of the parents are do you agree with me uh, because of the pressure from the parents uh sir i will i will little bit of i will to certain extent i will agree with you to certain extent uh, i will like to define i have seen both sides of the coin yes there is a pressure pressure by the parents parental pressure everyone wants to make their uh, you know children the best uh, like doctors engineers ias officer but there are other factors as well the more modern we are getting the more the children and adolescents are getting access to the internet there is a lack of effort lack of hard work everything is fast sir fast food fast pizza so the perseverance that is one of the key for the psychological development of a youngster is missing so i will not entirely blame the parents it's a combination of multiple factors nicely put it's really good actually yeah second thing is it is very important to counsel the relatives of the depressed patient which many of the people don't do it yeah exactly yes sir uh, you want my comments on that yes yeah yes. i fully agree with you sir in fact i will tell you these days there are a lot of youngsters who come directly to my opd and they don't bring anyone uh, because what they say is that if i tell my father or mother i am depressed they will scold me that you are mentally weak you have gone to a psychiatrist so 100% and the difficulty for a psychiatrist is that when these people have got a deliberate self harm or a suicidal ideas just prescribing medication to them is very risky they come to me i diagnose depression i write some medicine they go home and if they you know do some adventure next day parents will come and <laughs> will blast me like anything so it's a double edged sword so again you know spending time 
not starting the medicine unless it's a very severe depression calling the mother using the word counseling i have seen that it is liked by the family members and gradually after a few sessions of counseling still the i start medicine that works that's excellent dr suvas it was really nice but one thing suvas what we have opted to have seen is a lot of film actors you know a lot of stars are getting into depression they openly tell they openly discuss earlier the people used to get afraid of telling that you know they got a depression they never used to tell that you know they had visited a psychiatrist it was a lot of social stigma was attached nowadays they are very much opening up so what is your thing why the things are there why is happening why the depressions are more in this kind of a population yeah so what i understand that two part of this question why people are get start uh, people who are in the limelight they are getting more depression if you see the covid pandemic has got a big role if you see the stardom life and other things they are not planners like they don't go for ppa for certain other things for the future for retirement they are and they spend they buy so when they start rising they they feel that certain things are guaranteed for me now when those certain things are do not accord with the plan they go into depression coming to why they open up people are opening up now because depression the stigma is getting down as the you know every day passes if you see certain film actors like deepika padukone she has started one love live and life uh, foundation so it is encouraging so it is no more stigma the way it has been you know 15 20 years back to tell people know that depression even if you see the 2016 who topic was depression let's talk so things are improving that's good actually but any words of prevention because you are telling in 2030 it will one of be the leading cause of what you call disability what you are telling yes. so is there any prevention mode yes. i so had on, we can get developed that's a, another topic i had a, uh, almost like six or seven slides and i kept it as a behavioral vaccine for depression so it's a long topic but uh, if you want me to answer in a one sentence how to prevent depression the first thing what should i tell is lifestyle okay so eating properly the whatever our old grandma used to tell eat nicely sleep adequately okay and switch on and switch off don't carry your office to house enjoy in cash do not in cash your you know lips you enjoy i am a firm believer of not in cashing my any of my lips so far luckily enjoy the life there's only one life and always say that okay i always say i am 20 years with certain years of experience okay that's it. you know it's always said of that work life balance has to be there unless we have a work life balance it yes, is always I, bound you, to happen this depression you got the word that is what i wanted to say thank you <laughs> thank you so much if there are any questions I don't see any questions, Doctor Suhas. It was really nice talking to you. In fact, it was you know enlightening us. So many things we came to know. I would say that excellent talk, and probably put up things in a right proper fashion. And your dessert was also really good. Go ahead, Suhas sir. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, uh, Delhi branch, Doctor Gajendra sir, who is the president, Doctor Rajiv Jain sir, who has felt that I am worth speaking, and Doctor Shivan. I know it is not easy, Doctor Shivan. You know, I know how it is not easy. I mean this. guy has been almost like uh, for last four five days 10 o'clock 10:30 in holy other things so he has uh, this a wonderful guy i thank all of them thank, thank you, you dr shivang thank you thank you sir that, thank you dr shivang and uh, one thing i would like to say is don't in case suppose if you have missed dr shivas lecture it is definitely there only thing is you have to go to the youtube digi connect type in digi connect and look in for dr shivas it will always be there excellent talk please keep seeing it he excellently put forward how to do and do it it's really good Thank you, Dr. Suvas, and it was really. Uh, sir, once again, the closing remarks. Sir, actually, you are on the mute that time. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to thank uh, Delhi chapter and. Uh, Dr. Gajendra sir and uh, Dr. Shivang for providing us uh, this platform and uh, you know enlightening the knowledge of about uh, the managing the depression. It was really interesting and thank you so much. And I wish continue keep doing this. This was the 99th. I wish the hundredth series, whatever it is, it will be one of the more enlightening. And I wish to see a lot of other you know doctors also you know showing their interest in coming forward in this talk.
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you.